Well, is everyone ready for Lent? Do you know it's uh, February, about to be March? We're, we're moving along. Actually, a couple of weeks and we changed time, right? <clears throat> so time is moving. Lent's on its way. I hope, I hope you're ready. Um, who has um, taken a trip in an airplane? If you've ever flown in an airplane, ra raise your hand. Let me just get an... Oh, most of us. Now keep them up if you've been in a helicopter. Wow, that's amazing. Now, okay, put your hands down. Those that have been in a helicopter, did you enjoy... This is going to be hard to do, but... Helicopter or airplane, which did you enjoy? Did anyone prefer the airplane over the helicopter? All right, there's... <laughs> All right, there are a few. Well, I'm with the rest of you. I really enjoyed the helicopter until one of the helicopter pilots told me you, you're actually much safer in an airplane than you are a helicopter. It's a miracle this thing's even flying. Not the one I was in, but just helicopters in general. It's a miracle uh, they fly. I mean, really, all the moving parts. Those of you that have flown in a helicopter, did they tell you about the Jesus nut? You heard the story about the Jesus nut. This is, this is a true piece of equipment. The Jesus nut or pin. This is not only a true story, but this is true of the aircraft. Um, there is a Jesus nut on helicopters that hold the rotor onto the mass or the rest of the helicopter. It's one nut. And they call it the Jesus nut. Now the idea is that um, it represents what the, that, that piece, that nut represents is, in their language, is a single point of failure with catastrophic consequences. Now I'll, I'll say that again. A single point of failure. So of a helicopter there are a lot of pieces and moving parts that could fail. And if they fail, uh, a good pilot can, can land the, the helicopter. You, you can still, I mean, you could have some failures here or there and still, you know, be okay. But a single point of failure with catastrophic consequences, if this, so these things can fail, but if if that one piece right there fails, it's over. The rotor comes off and keeps going, and the helicopter and the crew drop. And the only thing left for them to do is pray, which is why they, I'm serious, that's why it's called the Jesus nut. It, the only thing left for you to do if that fails is pray to Jesus. That's it. Now today, with new technology and new techniques, there are, um, that nut doesn't exist on some of the newer helicopters, but the concept, the single point failure with catastrophic consequences still exists on helicopters. And in most cases, it's still called Jesus nut or the Jesus pin. Because if it fails, the only thing you've got to do is pray. That's it. Now, the same sort of thing happens in the Christian faith. Without a proper, biblical, good understanding of Jesus Christ, our, the Christian faith, just sort of falls apart. I, it's not even, uh, it, it's, it's not, I mean, it's not worth anything if, if w without Jesus, without a proper understanding of who He is, the, the whole thing just sort of falls apart on you. It, it's useless. Um, we're in our Lenten, we started a Lenten series early and we're, we're, we're in it right now. This is week two of a Lenten series on the Apostles' Creed. We're calling this series Creed. The Apostles' Creed is, um, we've already mentioned, one of the church's oldest 
statements of faith dates back to the second, third century. Um, every mainline denomination has a version of the Apostles' Creed. Um, <clears throat> a new piece I haven't shared yet, new piece of information, it's easy to assume that the Apostles' Creed got its name because the Apostles wrote the Creed. Not true. Uh, the Apostles' Creed has 12 affirmations, 12 statements of um, affirmations, things I believe. And rather than calling it the, the 12 affirmation creed, they said, well, we've got 12 affirmations, there's 12 apostles. The Apostles' Creed sounds better, so let's call it the Apostles' Creed. Of those 12 affirmations, Six are about Jesus. Six. It is, it emphasizes Jesus because it knows the Christian faith has this Jesus nut. And without it, and without a good understanding of it, the whole thing just sort of falls apart. So it wants to heavily emphasize Jesus. This, by the way, is one of the things on a helicopter that's checked every time be before they're, they're started up. You're going to check this one piece. The Apostles' Creed is sort of doing that for every believer. You want to check this one piece and make sure that your faith includes it. Otherwise, your flight, your journey, might be in danger as a Christian. So we have built in to our faith a check. It's the Apostles' Creed. Now, the church throughout history has uh, been influenced by secular views or pressures to change or alter its teachings. This is actually why we have creeds like the Apostles' Creed. When those pressures come, the church normally pushes back, and they push back with something like the Apostles' Creed. Um, the same is true for our day. I mean, we're no different uh, than the folks in the second and third century. We face uh, forces and views and worldviews that seek to try to uh, encourage the church to change its view on all sorts of things. Family, uh, money, uh, sin, sexuality. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of pressures today for the church to change their view on, on a teaching that has been passed down for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And hopefully the church will do what it's always done, push back and remind the world that it's not the world that changes the church, but it's the church and the truth that it bears that is supposed to change the world. Think of the mission statement of the United Methodist Church. It's on the United Methodist Church's website. Make disciples of Christ for the transformation of the world. That's who we are. Not to make disciples of Christ so that the world can transform us, but to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. The idea is that the world doesn't change the church. The church is supposed to change the world. So we get handed down from generation to generation for 2,000 years truth. And it's passed on to us. And we have it. In, in, in the case of this morning, in the series, we have it in the Apostles' Creed. Now, Jesus Christ is a central part of the church's message. What we've been passed, <clears throat> what we've been passed down. And our text this morning, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, says that Jesus is the radiant glory of God. The very presence of God himself. Now I like those words, the radiant glory, because to me it reminds me of the sun and its radiant heat. It's... I mean, sun rays. Um, when you're standing in the sun, you can, even, even when it's cold outside, if you move to where the sun's shining in, you can feel the sun. You can feel the heat. 
the radiant heat from it. Now that makes me feel good, especially this morning, knowing that uh, the weather folks are saying that uh, that radiant sun may be gone for a couple of days, but I like that image of the radiant um, sun. You know, scientists, they always do a study. It, it tends to always be about the same. Uh, if the sun went out, you know, what would happen? Uh, some of you have read this uh, in, in the magazines. If, if the sun goes out, for example, we have eight minutes. It takes about eight minutes for the light to get to us, the heat. So we, sun goes out, we've got about eight minutes to soak up as much of that radiant sunlight as we can. And then around eight minutes, the light's just going to go out. Within a few days, the surface temperature of planet Earth will be at zero. And within a few more days, this will be a deep freeze. Our solar system hinges on the sun. It is a single reference, single point failure with catastrophic consequences. If the sun goes out, this is all over. Again, the same sort of thing happens in our faith with Jesus. The text says that Jesus is the radiant glory of God. When we read the Apostles' Creed on Sunday morning, we say that we believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Now, remember last week, names mean something. Those names are all very important. They cover both Jesus' humanity and His divinity. There is no other religion or sub-sect or group that will affirm that statement. Not Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hindu, not Jehovah's Witness, not Mormon, no one's going to claim what we claim about Jesus, that He is God's only Son, our Lord. That means we're saying He's our God. He's our Lord. Jesus is God. God is Jesus. Now that's powerful. Again, nobody else says that. We are unique in our belief in Jesus. Now there's an interesting story about Jesus that actually comes from a Hindu. Uh, most the older folks will remember uh, Gandhi or at least the name Gandhi. There was a United Methodist, well it was a Methodist minister at the time, early 1900s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, e. Stanley Jones. He was a Methodist missionary to India. He was uh, so influential in his day that he was asked to be bishop and he turned down being bishop in the Methodist church because his work was too important. He was a missionary in India. Good friends with Gandhi. Um, he wrote a book entitled um, Gandhi, Portrait of a Friend. In that book, he describes a conversation he had with Gandhi. And E. Stanley Jones asked him, what is it that we Christians need to do better? Basically, we're uh, foreigners in this country, in India. How do we make our faith more natural to um, those living in India, to Indians? What do we need to do better as Christians? And the most influential Hindu of the day said this. First, I would suggest that all you Christians must begin to live more like Jesus Christ. Second, practice your religion without adulterating it or toning it down. Within two sentences, he identified our Jesus nut, Jesus Christ. Basically, if you just figure out who Jesus is, 
and follow his teachings more serious than you are, you will add to the world what nobody else in Hindu, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, no one else can offer the world what you offer, and it's Jesus Christ. That is, that's what it's all about for you. And without Jesus, your faith falls apart. Now, we do have something unique. We have something we believe is very important and something that the world desperately needs. It is a truth that can penetrate any heart, cleanse any sin, and restore any soul. It is the truth found in Jesus Christ. It's been passed down for 2,000 years, and it's been given to us in this generation. And it's something we shouldn't compromise on because it's something we're going to pass on to the next generation. We believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, the radiant glory of God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for you, for reminding us that your radiance and your glory and your very presence is found in Jesus Christ. And that is something unique. That your church, that your family, that your disciples, that your people have to offer to the world. Lord, we thank you for our uniqueness and we thank you for being such a blessed people by your presence. Help and encourage your church to move forward as we move into Lent. Help us to faithfully practice spiritual disciplines as we move closer towards celebrating ultimately the work that you did on the cross for us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.